So let me talk you through what my usage is because it's been a real, real good case study for me to live understand the challenges of operating with both Fiat and Bitcoin. But so obviously we're a football club. We um, uh, have different revenue streams. So one is tickets, mm -hmm. which we sell in advance and we sell on the day. Uh, we have mer merchandise. Again, we sell uh, online, but you can also uh, buy them at the ground. We sell programs, which you can buy online and at the ground, including subscriptions online. And then on match day, we have uh, the ability to buy merchandise. We have the ability to, uh, sorry, not merchandise, uh, we've already covered that, uh, food and drink, beer, you know, a burger, whatever. And in every scenario, we want to be able to accept fiat and Bitcoin. We also have the need to pay people. So we have staff and we mm -hmm. have um, uh kind of running costs and like um, bills, you know, things like gas, electric. So there's a range of things. Um, what The way we've set it up, oh, and we have sponsors, right? So any sponsor that's paid me in Bitcoin, I'm holding in Bitcoin in our treasury. Anyone who buys merchandise or buys for anything in the ground and pays in Bitcoin, it's like one in 15 to one in 20 transactions. Uh, all runs through open node and we keep that 100% in Bitcoin because mm -hmm. we're like, because it's because of the volume, we know we never need that for operational costs, and, but we keep them what we call our float. It's like our Bitcoin float. And then what happens is when we have any Bitcoin payments that need to be made, we pay that from that float. Um, we're not paying anyone yet in Bitcoin, but I'm assuming it's going to come. At least one player I think is going to turn around and say at some point. In terms of how we manage this, it's all over the place. Mm -hmm. But the thing that's all over the place is the Bitcoin side. It's not the um, it's not the fiat side because, as you are well aware, the tooling already exists. The accounting system already exists. Correct. So when you know we've got a Zettel reader and the Zettel reader has all our stock on there, and when we when we uh, pay something, the stock gets deducted. We get the uh, payment reference goes into our system. The money goes to our bank, and uh, that's all reported in our accounting system. Perfect. Works well, great. With Bitcoin, what tends to happen is everything just goes into one big pot. Yep. <laughs> one big pile of, I don't know if it's separate UTXOs or like records and spreadsheets, but we we don't know. So if you said to me, Pete, how many tickets you sold? I can say, we sold this many tickets. How much How much um, Bitcoin did you get for those tickets? I'd be like, huh? I don't know. Yep. What's the value of that Bitcoin? I don't know. It's That bit is a mess. And then... That is the exact challenge that we saw and we set out to solve. Right. We started Fortress back in 2017. Um, and at the time, um, we were looking at all the tooling that was coming out for Bitcoin as an individual user, right? That allowed you to be self-sovereign, to, to take advantage of all the benefits that Bitcoin brings. But there was nearly zero in uh, tooling for corporate usage, um, unless you went the third-party uh, processor route where someone else is holding your keys and, and, and they're managing it for you, right? Um, so the use cases you described, um, effectively what we do is for every single payment, be it retail or, or B2B, um, there's an order set up in a fortress. We track the basis. Uh, there's a reference number. Uh, Fortress uh, pushes the journal entries into your accounting system, so it's all reconciled. And and all of the challenges you were describing, you can track. But there's a another challenge that a lot of people don't realize because if you're looking at um, you're, you're coming from a background of having used Bitcoin personally, right? So obviously security, you understand how important security is. Yep. But security for individual use is very very different than the other considerations you need to have for corporate use. So that's where governance comes in, right? If, if for personal use, I can get a hardware wallet. I can shop around. Uh, there are many options. I can set up my wallet. I can secure my, uh, my backup. And I can be confident that my Bitcoin is secure. For corporate use cases, we've seen horror stories where um, among potential customers where we rolled out Fortress, um, where 
they were trying to replicate that in a corporate world. So they had hardware wallets that the CFO controlled and they were locked away in a safe. And, and that's essentially what I have. Exactly. And, and as long as you're a small operation and you trust yourself, that's fine. But there's another challenge. Even if you trust that person, um, there's a challenge of that person potentially becoming a target for attackers, right? So just so. It, just compare it to our fiat thing. So in terms of running the podcast, yeah. Emma does all the bookings and the arranging of travel for me, guests, whatever. Um, she has a card and she can make bookings. Yep. And she sends me an approval and I approve it. And all works great, yep. yada, yada. On the Bitcoin side, if we ever have, we actually had a need for some Bitcoin for, we ran a meetup before the first game and we were going to give donations. Hmm. So we had to get the Bitcoin, but I was away at the time. So there was no way of anyone getting that done. Well, exactly. So you yeah, have security considerations, you have business continuity and scalability, or you're a single point of failure for all Bitcoin payments at the moment. Right. Mm -hmm. So that those are the kind of challenges that we solve by introducing governance. So what, what we mean by governance is defining operational and security protocols for how you use Bitcoin. So you, you can define different types of accounts. You might have a treasury account that you're comfortable that you have to be, you have to have final sign off before funds can leave treasury. But then you can have operational accounts. You can have a if if you're introducing um Bitcoin into your payroll, you can have a payroll account where you can set up, um, let's say, a dual sign-off workflow where someone in, um, in the operations team who sets up the, the recurring payments can set up the order, they can provide one of the required sign-offs, and you provide a, the, the final sign-off, very similar to how you're using the, uh, the, the fiat uh, system today. And it goes beyond that. We can also control allow you to, to control who has access to what accounts, what visibility they have, what kind of uh, operations they can carry out. I'm assuming you have a, an accountant. Um, you could give your accountant auditor rights where they can go and pull all the reports, see all the transactions without necessarily having the ability to set up payments. Um, and, and this is really the, the, the main difference between personal use and corporate use, right? For personal use, as long as you have a hardware wallet, you're, you can control your own keys, that's perfect. That works. But we don't have that for our Fiat account because it wouldn't work. I mean, no. Danny needs to organize things. I do. Emma does. Yep. And we, we all just kind of know where to go to do this. It, it's just very smooth. And like I say, I do. I mean, at the football club, I have me, Emma, Tom, all accessing payments and doing things. I'm the only one with access to the Bitcoin. So I guess what you're saying is you've created the infrastructure that allows people to use Bitcoin like they use fiat. I mean, I'm not it's, saying exactly the same, but like you've given us, you're given the t same tooling we have elsewhere. It's interesting you you would say that very early on when we started designing the user experience for this, uh, we, we had to choose a persona for who's the typical user. And the persona we chose is someone who's familiar with financial software, yeah, but they're not a Bitcoin expert. Huh. And... I like to think that we've done a decent enough job that it turned out to be quite intuitive. The learning curve is, is not too steep when, when we rolled this out to, to customers. And, and interestingly, with the, the COVID uh, lockdowns, um, we, we, we received some very interesting positive feedback from customers that we've already rolled this out to, where they were saying, well, look, now that all of our staff is remote, this is brilliant for us because now we, we can still continue operating without having to overhaul our procedures. We can still have multi sign off uh, where we have people in different parts of the world and they can set up transactions and, and authorize them. Whereas before everyone had to be in, in the same physical location to, to do that. Do you have the facility to manage between hot and cold wallets? Is um, there like a, yes. because that's one of the things that the next challenge is that I have to think about is that as that Bitcoin stack grows, I do want that float that's available Correct. Uh, for making quick payments, but I do also want a cold wallet. Yep. And will we be able to mix between the two? So effectively, what we allow um, Fortress users is the ability to set up multiple accounts, right? Okay. And, and every account in Fortress is a wallet. But how that wallet is set up, that is flexible, right? So that's where the security model comes in. That's where the governance comes in. You can have complete cold storage. That's air gap. You can have hot operational wallets. It's 
it's not really the typical hot wallet where you have a key stored somewhere and it's and, and that comes with its own risks right we um it, it's it's a bit more complex than that because you have distributed signing built into this and business rules validation etc mm-hmm. but ultimately we can make that distinction and you can choose how you want to allocate the funds among your um your accounts the fortress are you guys on a bitcoin standard um, we're in the same situation as as you guys would be, it's right? We're, we're, it's a mixed bag. We're we're living in a fiat world. We do have um, I mean, we we do have staff that are hundred percent paid in Bitcoin. We have staff. Hundred percent. Yes, we do. Bold. What do you think, Danny? Do you want to do it? I mean, I'll, I'll get paid in Bitcoin. Hundred <laughs> percent. Is it possible to have this interact with like a wallet that you have custody of, or is it all custodian cus- custodied with you? No, actually. So we do not custody funds. Mm-hmm. We don't <laughs> hold anyone's keys. Um, we built this to a self-custody use case. So you have a vault that gets deployed on-premise or in the cloud, That's um, there are a couple of options. If you want to run this on top of an HSM, you can do that. If you want to do air gap cold storage, you can do that as well. And then Fortress basically is a SaaS type software that runs on top of this. Um, and it hooks into your key management, right, or your vault for the actual sign-off of, of the transactions. Um, now, that was the initial use case we've built it to. As you can imagine, not everyone wants to self-custody and not everyone has the capability to, uh, to self-custody. So we've uh, since then introduced the option. So we, we have flexibility where Fortress customers can choose if they want to self-custody or use a third-party qualified custodian. So if I if I was uh, yeah, holding my Bitcoin in a, a ledger, for example, um, that that integrates with Fortress, so you can not today, but I don't see any barriers why we could not. Uh, set so up that where would yet. the Bitcoin? So you said you don't hold the keys, but do you have specific services you integrate with them? So we offer uh, the the Vault software, which which we we license to our customers. They can deploy it, or we can help them deploy it themselves. And then that effectively is is their their key management solution. Oh, okay. So so you have there is a product you have. There to is to yes. Do that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And yeah. and that is that a company you own or? Yeah, so we we build that. That's that's so part of Fortress it. as well. Yes. So but but then you are holding the private keys. It's our customers who holds the the private keys. We we license them the software. So it's okay. the same way that when you buy uh, a ledger, right? Ledger is not holding your your private yeah, keys. Yeah, I see. What you're saying. It's running on your own hardware. You set it up. Yeah. You control it. So yeah. it would be similar to that. So in terms of building this, were you were you your own test customer to begin with? No, uh, we were fortunate enough that um, when we started this, we had a couple of large customers who were already using Bitcoin in an operational capacity um, that we could use as our initial use case and, and, and customers. And they were happy to because... I mean, to be frank, they were in the reality of of locking away uh, ledgers and treasures in a safe, and and their finance team doing most of their reconciliation and accounting in Excel, and 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 dealing with all of the challenges that that you just described at a massive scale. So you just built it collaboratively with them. Yep, yeah, pretty much. That's pretty. So we, awesome. we built it to a real world use case from from the beginning. What if uh, those two companies had conflicting wishes for the product? Do you, do you do customization or is it complete? We tried our best to build this to be industry uh, agnostic. And our approach was if, if, if they ever come to us with use cases that we don't truly believe in, then we would put a feature flag in place. We would try to do it in such a, such a way that it doesn't affect the core product. And I like to think that we've succeeded in that. Um, and today we, we have customers across many different industries and, and it seems to be working quite well. Um, but I think we were very fortunate that we had the chance to build to real world use cases as opposed to trying to figure out in a vacuum, okay, what exactly would be the challenges of, of Bitcoin in, in, in an enterprise uh, setting? It's interesting because um, the, the trend for our business is only one direction. Right? Mm-hmm. We will only see an increasing market share being taken uh, by Bitcoin uh, in terms of the you know, number of transactions we do. I've got no idea if we get to the point where it's you know, much higher than, I don't know, we're probably like 5% at the moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've got no idea if it gets to like 20, 30, 40%, but the tra- trajectory is only one way. Yep. And so I guess for you as a company, that's your, your spot in that trend because, I mean, we're going to get to the point where almost every company has to be able to do this. Well, and, and, and that is our vision and mission to 
allow more and more companies to want to adopt Bitcoin as an operational asset because that's we, we see that as the next natural step in in the adoption cycle for for Bitcoin, right? Um, and then to give them a tooling to be able to ramp that up. So even within um, those existing customers, right, the, the, who we used as our initial use cases, when we started, I um, I think Bitcoin was somewhere around. 20, 30% of their retail payments. Uh -huh. And now it's closer to 70. Wow. So just within those, um, the and and it's really driven by the end users. They want to use it. And and obviously from also from an internal point of view, so the, these customers use it heavily uh, to pay their staff. Um, so they, they would fall into the category of what well, I would say they offer a, digital experience, right? So they um, they use Bitcoin in many different ways. They use it to accept payment from their customers. They use it to pay their suppliers, vendors. They use it also for cross-border. They have operations in, in different jurisdictions. And initially, they started with the hands-off approach. They started with introducing Bitcoin as an alternative payment method. And bit by bit, they realized the, the advantages and, and they got to a point where it's like predominantly a Bitcoin business. Um, one of the challenges, I guess, that traditional accounting software has is that every country is quite different, different accounting rules, different accounting practices. But when you're building software for people who are using Bitcoin, I'm guessing you still have to do certain customization for certain uh, reporting requirements in countries. But So for, for the... Or, 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 or is Bitcoin building a standard way of working? So it doesn't matter whether you're in El Salvador or Bedford or Malaga, the, the software essentially works exactly the same. So w one thing that seems to be common across most jurisdictions today is the way Bitcoin is classified. So Bitcoin is classified as a non-depreciating intangible asset, right? And And... If you look at the two primary jurisdictions, right, you have um, uh, the uh, GAAP accounting standards in the US, and for some reason, the, the name of the standard escapes me, which is the, the global equivalent of that. The approach is very, very similar. So you need to track basis at the time that- Explain the to me what you mean by track basis. So effectively, when you receive a Bitcoin, okay. be it through, in, in your use case, um, you sold a ticket or you sold something on the day of the match, you receive a Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. um, there's a price point that will be associated or you have to associate with that Bitcoin at the time that you've acquired it. And from an accounting point of view, if you're sitting on that Bitcoin for two years and since then the, the price of Bitcoin has gone up, from an accounting point of view, the value is still the original value. Right. Right, and the new value is not locked in until use or dispose. Right, so until you use it somehow or you sell it, and when you've done that, then you have a realized gain or loss. And then at that point, depending on the jurisdiction where you're in, you have to file some form of tax report for that transaction. Right, and that last mile, that is what is jurisdictionally specific. So what we do there is is we we try to partner up with companies that do that last mile for the report. We can give them all the data. We track the basis and we give them all the data and then they can help craft the tax reporting. Or depending on the customer, some customers have the tax specialist in-house and they can build those reports uh, themselves to be compliant with the local jurisdiction. That uh, that price volatility is one of the biggest challenges to all of this. It is. It, 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 is, it is. And, um, and we've invested quite a bit of effort in, in building tooling to be able to visualize that. And, and to be able to give um, effectively decision makers the ability to to decide when, how much they want to be exposed to and when they should on and off ramp. So we we build the capability to track unrealized gains or losses. Mm -hmm. um, you can look at, obviously it's, it's the use case I described is very simple because we're looking at one transaction. But even in your use case, if, if that number goes up, let's say it goes up to 10%, that's still a large number of transactions. And every single time you have a different basis, you have a different uh, uh, fiat reference that you need to keep track of. Um, and 
what we can do is, is by building this data model, you can then look and see, okay, right now with the price of Bitcoin as it is, I have X amount in unrealized gains. Maybe it's a good time to lock some of that in. And, lock and, some of it in. Yeah. Or maybe, no, maybe I want to wait a bit more. 